folks if anybody's there you can um, send me an icon or something let me know this is the first time we've tried anything like this so uh, give us just a minute to make sure our connection signal is strong all right well looks like some folks are joining us I'm glad you're here uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll look in God's Word. Lord, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come here today and open your Word. Thank you for those who are watching. May we receive a blessing from your Word. And um, thank you for giving us the technology to be able to do this. We pray now that you would uh, give us a, um, a strong signal. May everything that's involved with the technology work. And I pray that it be done to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to have you with us. Uh, I'm Pastor Brad Ingram. I'm sure uh, most of you probably know my face, I'm sorry to say. But we're enjoying a little vacation here in the Smoky Mountains with my family. And I'll just pan over real quick to show you what some of our scenery looks like. And um, you can just see a little bit. I think we've got some weather may be moving in so uh, pray everything goes well i really am um, glad you came to join us we have these family bible studies from time to time and uh, the lord impressed upon my heart to open it up for those of you out there who may want to join us and so if you have a bible i know not all of you are probably in a position where you can have the bible there but turn to first chronicles chapter 12 and this is a very informal study so uh, you may hear kids running around, going here and there, door slamming, whatever the case may be. Uh, so just enjoy it. And if you have your Bible there, we're in First Chronicles chapter 12. If for some reason we lose the signal, uh, just be patient and uh, I'll get back on as quick as I can. But First Chronicles chapter 12, I'm going to read to you one verse, verse number 32. And I believe that there's a phrase in this verse that you and I ought to desire to conform our lives to. First Chronicles 12:32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Notice that phrase. The Lord said there were men in Israel that had understanding of of the times and if you're a child of God and you have a Bible um, these times in which we're living should not really surprise you at all uh, in fact the Bible tells us that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived and so tonight this little lesson for just a few minutes is going to be concerned with the current events the state of our world and of our country and how they relate to the setting up of the Antichrist. Now, an objection could be raised. What do we need to know about the Antichrist? Didn't that sort of a dark subject? Uh, aren't we to be looking for Christ, not the Antichrist? Uh, I understand that, but the Scripture teaches that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And uh, if you have any knowledge of Bible prophecy whatsoever, you'll know there are things happening in our country and in our world that point to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we believe the Bible teaches that the very next thing on God's calendar is the rapture of the church, and that is that great event whereby Jesus comes and receives us who have trusted him as our Savior. He receives us up into heaven. We receive our glorified body. Now, after that, there's going to be a period of seven years on this earth of unparalleled trouble. In fact, the book of Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the time known as tribulation. After those seven years of tribulation, the Lord himself will come again, visibly, physically, literally, back to this earth with us. You'll find that in Revelation chapter 19, to set up a 1,000-year literal, visible, earthly kingdom on this planet. 
during those seven years of tribulation, there's going to be a superman in power on this earth. He's going to be the master politician. He's going to be the master uh, financier. He's going to be a master orator, um, one of the elite. And he goes by many names in Scripture. You probably heard him referred to as simply the Antichrist. And so let's turn to a few passages and ask the Lord to give us some understanding of our times. I'm a young man, and uh, but I think I can fairly say that I've never seen events in our country that seem to be progressing as quickly down the wrong road as they are now. I'm not going to give you uh, the Democratic platform or the Republican platform or the Libertarian platform on this study. Uh, what we're going to look at tonight are Bible principles that transcend uh, any particular wing of politics or any party. And uh, the burden of my heart, as I said again, is to see if the Bible can shed some light on our society. I may be talking to some folks here, and you've really got concerned about the state of uh, our uh, world and our country, and rightly so. But I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian, you ought to remember the words of your Savior when he said in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So I hope this study will encourage you a little. I don't have to remind you of some of the things that have been happening in our country uh, with the, uh, this so-called war between the police and the criminals, the government corruption. I'm sure you've been following the uh, House, the hearings up at the House now, considering the FBI's report on um, Secretary Clinton, all this, and the government, racial divisions in our country. There seems to be a vacuum of leadership. Um, there's a shifting of alliances in Europe. If you have not studied what's happened in Britain here in the last couple of weeks, it would do well to study. There's a movement there, I'm sure you've heard of it, known as Brexit. It's where the British people have voted and expressed their desire to leave the European Union. That's a big deal, uh, Britain being one of the more influential countries of the world. So a lot of things are happening. Uh, the transgender so-called element. All these things have come about in our country within the past few weeks. And that's a, a tremendous speed and haste whereby you see these things happening. And I believe, again, the answer to all of it can be found in Scripture. Now, as I said, this is an informal study. I have my laptop here with me. If you've got a question you'd like to ask during the study, go ahead and submit it. And if I come to a spot that I can... Uh, answer that I will at that time but go ahead and submit it and uh, we'll see how far along we get uh, again glad you're here appreciate you being here so let's just dive into it um, only a Bible believer can put all these events we've just listed into perspective only a Bible student of prophecy uh, has an anchor on which to stand uh, folks we have God's blessed us with five children and I thank the Lord for it I'm here with my family now up here at this cabin but if I didn't know what the scripture said about our society and about the Lord Jesus Christ it would be a very fearful place to live in this world indeed if I didn't know what the Lord said about how this thing's going to come out um, I would be in constant terror for the future of my children you say, are you not worried about the kind of country they're going to grow up in? Well, if the Lord hasn't come back by then, I'm standing on what the Bible said in the book of Jude concerning Jesus Christ, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. So this is a tough time. This is a difficult time in our world, but the Lord's greater. So what about the rise of Antichrist? Let's take these events of uh, current days and current months and put them together in Scripture and maybe encourage us a little bit that the coming of our Lord uh, is certainly not. Now, we've got one question here. Is America mentioned as being a world power in the book of Revelation? Why or why not? That's a good question. I've been asked that on more than one occasion. Um, America, of course, uh, is not mentioned directly. We do know that America will be a part of that one world army that will unite against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. We know that because the scripture said, I will gather all nations together against Jerusalem. So while America has enjoyed a good relationship with Israel up to this point, during the tribulation, she will turn just as all other nations will turn against Israel and come against Israel to battle. 
And of course, you and I understand what happens to a country that comes against Israel. So America does not seem to play a major part in prophecy. Another reason for that is the Antichrist himself, who we'll be looking at in just a moment, uh, he's not an American. He's a European. He rises out of the old Roman Empire, which never had any uh, basis in America at all. So we don't see America taking a very strong element in prophecy. Uh, at least the scripture doesn't give any intimation of that. That's a good question. Let's lay a foundation then. How do we get to 2016? How do we get to where rioting in the streets? How do we get to where a statement was just released? I found this out from my brother. A statement was just released uh, just a short time ago, I assume, by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, uh, who was a um, very respected and very revered uh, uh, member of the Army, in fact, training staff. He made this statement. He said that the next wave of terrorism will be children storming their schools and killing one another in their schools, I'm paraphrasing now, all because of what they've seen in video games and the media. Well, how do we get there? Um, this quote was found in the New York Times, May 9th, 1999. The evidence is overwhelming. To argue against it is like arguing against gravity. American Psychological Association on the Wealth of Information Linking Media Violence and Teen Violence. Did you get that? That's from the New York Times. They've never been known as a bastion for conservatism. So how do we get here? That's the question. Well, open your Bible and let's go back to the origin of this conflict. Again, what I hope to do by the Lord's power and spirit is to find out how we got to where we are in America and what the future is for us in the context of Scripture. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, if you have your Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at the foundation for this conflict. Again, how did we get to this place? It didn't happen overnight. You didn't go to sleep last night, um, surrounded by the American dream and the way it may have been in the 50s and 60s, and wake up this morning to the headlines. This is a process, and there is certainly a satanic movement behind it. Genesis chapter 3, let's lay the foundation on how we got to where we are today. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this chapter. This chapter, we see the entrance of the devil into human affairs. And uh, begin at verse number 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now notice what we've just read is the account of Adam and Eve after they had transgressed the only commandment God gave them. They partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so now we see their shame, their nakedness. You see, all was well with God's creation before Genesis chapter 3. And then we go on, verse 11, And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is that this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Um, I've heard it said here, what happened here was Adam blamed his wife, and his wife blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. Where was the buck going to stop here? But nonetheless, that's the progression. Now, Here's the foundation, folks, of where we're living. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. God here is pronouncing a curse. When sin came into the universe, it brought the curse of God. Now, you don't read anything about the devil in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. He doesn't show up until chapter 3. So, as many of you know, the first two chapters of our Bible have no devil. And the last two chapters of our Bible have no devil. The Lord dispatches with him. And I'm thankful that the devil had a beginning 
as far as he was a, he's a created being, he's not eternal, and he'll have an ending. I don't mean by that he'll be destroyed and annihilated, but he'll be shut up into a place where he'll never be able to bother you anymore. And uh, that's a blessing, isn't it? To be in a place where you're out of the reach of the devil's temptation. Now that's the curse. Now again, to keep ourselves on track, we're looking at the question, how do we get to where we are in America? You may think, what in the world does Genesis chapter 3 have to do with the rioting and the killing of uh, police officers and um, the uh, child prostitution, and child trafficking, all that we see in this country? How can you connect Genesis chapter 3 with where we're living? Well, notice the curse again. He said in verse 14, this is their punishment, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and upon every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Here's a little nugget for you. I'm sure many of you know this. But God cursed the serpent here to eat dust and to go on his belly. If you study the millennium, as Isaiah gives it to us in chapter 65, you'll learn that the serpent is the only animal upon which God does not lift the curse. During the millennium, the curse is lifted off the animal kingdom. But in Isaiah 65, verse 24, you know what the Bible says about the serpent? Even in the millennium, he said he would eat dust. Dust would be the serpent's meat. So, uh, And that explains something else, by the way. Most people, i got to watch how I say this because there may be some uh, um, snake enthusiasts in our audience, but most people have a natural aversion to snakes. At least I do. Uh, there's just something about a snake, and I think that goes back to the temptation here in us. It goes hearkening back to that serpent. So we see here the effects of this curse. Now, notice we see God's curse upon the serpent. Look at what the Bible says God did concerning the women. Verse number 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Mark verse 15, that's the cornerstone of this study. What you see in verse 15, you see the commencing of a conflict that started way back here in Genesis 3.15 and is still going on July the 14th, 2016, right here today. You want to know how we got here? Look back at that cursed Genesis 3.15. Folks, the evil in this world can be traced directly back to what God said to the woman. He said to the woman, your seed and the seed of the serpent would be locked in a warfare whose uh, outcome is known, of course. We know that the Lord here is predicting the devil's ruin and ultimate defeat. But if you want to know how America got here, that's where you got to start, back there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That is the beginning of of the conflict itself. So we see the curse upon the serpent, and that curse was not lifted even in the millennium. I gave you that verse. That's Isaiah 65, 24. But then as far as the women are concerned, look at verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we know what God did to the serpent as far as the woman's concerned. Uh, God made labor difficult. And, of course, in, in this verse, he clearly laid down the idea or the, uh, the injunction that a woman was to be in submission to her husband. Of course, that doesn't have anything to do with value or importance, just a matter of order. Now, again, we're going to leave Genesis 3.15 for just a minute, but don't leave without getting that settled in your mind. Verse 15, the enmity between thee and the woman. Notice what God did to the earth. You see verse 17, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commended thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. See what God did? He cursed the creation here. Have you ever wondered why it's easier to grow weeds than it is strawberries? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, have you ever thought about it, it takes no effort at all to grow weeds, but if you're going to grow something as far as a crop, you've got to really work at it. That all goes back to that curse. He told Adam in verse 19, in the sweat of thy face. Now here's an experiment you can try. 
Most folks, when they quote that verse, if they're not reading it from the Bible, they'll say something like this. They'll say, man was to work by the sweat of his brow. If you've heard it quoted that way, uh, push your little icon there. If you've heard folks quote it by man shall eat of the sweat of his brow, uh, send, send us one of those little emoticons. Is that what you call them here? I've got a captivative audience. But technically, it doesn't say that. Of course, it doesn't say the sweat of thy brow. It says the sweat of thy face. You see what we do as humans, folks? There we go. Yeah, you've heard it. A lot of you folks are chiming too now. You see what happens? We try to reverse the curse, even unknowingly. God said the sweat would be all down your face, and when we quote it, we want to limit it to the sweat of our brow. Um, you ever thought about how much money is spent trying to reverse the effects of the curse? Uh, I'm not saying anything's wrong with this, but every beauty counter you see, every face cream, uh, all the eyeliner, lipstick, everything. I mean men, too. Hair gel, hair tonic. You know what all that's doing? That's trying to reverse the curse. My audience is going to walk out on me here. But then again, you see uh, medications to uh, ease women's pain in childbearing. I'm not against that. We had five children. I thank the Lord for it. But you see what we do? We try to reverse the effects of the curse. But they won't totally be lifted, folks, until the Lord lifts it. You see those thorns and thistles there in verse 18? You remember what they put up on the head of our Savior? You remember what that crown was made of? It wasn't made of gold. It was made of thorns and thistles. That signified our Savior was bearing the curse from the top of his head all the way down to the crown of his foot. He sees here in these thorns and thistles. Now, Verse number 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now that's the curse. What about this conflict? And here's where I want to pray the Lord help us, give us some instruction. The major element of this curse is found back there in verse 15. And some of you have just joined us, so I want to read it again. And I will put enmity, God speaking here, I will put enmity, that word enmity has the idea of strife and warfare. Uh, our word enemy comes from that word, the root word for enmity, between thee and the woman. Now that should have tripped your thinking. If you have any inkling of biological knowledge concerning the human body, you'll know that it's not natural for the woman to have the seed. That's provided by the man. You see, I'm not going to give you a biology lesson here, but the man uh, provides the seed, and the woman, of course, biologically provides the egg for the child. But God said here that it would be the seed of the woman. That's very strange. That's not how it is. But you see what God was doing? God said there's going to be one special case, one rare event, in which the woman will have the seed and that's the virgin birth of our Savior. So even way back here in Genesis 3, God's giving us that little hint there about the virgin birth. So that's the first thing that ought to catch your attention. This is where the conflict begins. Now, if you're making notes here, I want to mark this down. The seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't get this foundation, the rest of the study really won't make much sense to you. The seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. The seed of the serpent is the Antichrist. And that is the figure we're looking at tonight. The seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, the seed of the serpent is the Antichrist. And don't miss this, folks. All the rest of the Bible, after Genesis 3.15, is simply the outworking of that enmity. Genesis 4 all the way through, you know what you have? You have a running history of that enmity, that warfare, that struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But let me remind you, we know the outcome of that, that warfare. We know Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 tells us that he hath put all things under the feet of our Savior, and that includes the serpent's head. So we can be encouraged. You ever felt like that maybe it would almost appear that evil would win and that evil carries the day and that the evil is, goes unpunished while the wrong is rewarded? Sometimes you feel that way. But we know the outcome of this struggle. And the outcome of Genesis 3.15 is found in the book of Revelation. And there's no coincidence there 
that the most misunderstood book in the Bible among God's people is the book of Revelation. If you were the devil, wouldn't you want to keep a book that tells you're ruined? Wouldn't you want to keep that concealed from the hearts and minds of men? Sure you would. You wouldn't want them to know. See, they'll give a believer power to resist the world, the flesh, and the devil. We know how he ends up. We know he's not the victor. So what about this? Let's trace the seed of the serpent all the way through here. Here's the heart of my lesson, and we'll make it very quick. We've seen the conflict. It began back here in Genesis 3.15. That's where it started. Enmity. God said there'll be warfare and struggle between the seed of the woman, that's Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent, and that's the devil. Now, to lay the foundation a little, a little more firmly, I want to give you a brief survey all the way through our Bible, coming up to the Old Testament, of the serpent's attempt to stamp out that seed of the woman. And again, if you're just joining us, we're getting to the conclusion, how did we get to where we are in America today? Only a Bible believer can really make sense of the current situation. Uh, political commentators, they give a stab at it. There are some good ones, there are some bad ones. And uh, many of them give very good ideas and they have their theories about how we got here, but the Bible is the only sure foundation for telling us where we are, how we got here, and then thankfully where we're going. So how did we get here? Well, look at the history quickly of this conflict that started in Genesis 3.15. Some of you remember, and maybe if you're fast on the gun here, you can uh, type it in, the first man uh, to ever experience uh, the first death in our world. Who was it that was murdered way back there in Genesis? I'm sure many, many most of you know who that was. You see, the devil was doing something. As he inspired Cain to murder his brother Abel, that was the devil working through Cain. Cain is said to be of that wicked one. So what you have the devil, once he heard that prophecy back in Genesis 3.15, you know what he wanted to do, folks? He wanted to stop that prophecy from coming to pass. God had said the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head, so if you were the devil, who would you want to stop? You'd want to stamp out that seed of the woman before he dealt you that death blow. The devil tried it with Abel, but aren't you thankful that the Lord always makes a way? After Abel was murdered, we know who came along, don't we? Seth came along. You see, folks, the devil never can get the Lord in a corner. And you can't get the Lord figured out. I'm talking probably to some brothers and sisters here who you've come to the Lord in prayer about an issue, and as far as you're concerned, the Lord can do A, B, or C, uh, and then he'll pull an option D on you, something you never saw coming. Only the Lord can do that. So we see here, that's where this conflict starts. Then you kind of come, and guess what the devil does next? He attempts to unite mankind in a global effort to ascend to heaven in their own strength. Remember that? The Tower of Babel? You know what that was? You know what was behind all that, folks? That was man's attempt to get to God, to get to heaven in their own strength. There was no bloodshed involved, no prayers being made for the blessing upon the work at the Tower of Babel. These men came together. Who was behind it all? It was the devil himself. Folks, that's what God still judges today. Any attempt to get to heaven without the Lord Jesus Christ is going to end the same way the building project in Babel ended. Confusion. And, of course, the work was abandoned. So the devil couldn't stop it at the Tower of Babel. God made a way. And then you know what the devil did. I'm coming on down here now in the Old Testament. He attempted to pervert the thoughts and deeds of all men. And maybe by some chance, if the devil could permeate all society and make the thoughts and tents of man's heart evil continually. If the devil could just do that, maybe he could stop that seed of the woman from doing him in. We know what happened. God sent the flood. Noah was saved. God started over again. You know what else the devil did after the flood? He submerged the children of God into Egypt, and the devil hoped to uh, scatter them among the pagan religion and the customs and cultures of the Egyptians so they would lose their Jewish identity. Did he succeed? No, he didn't. Of course, the Lord brought them out. Uh, in our Lord's day, you know what the uh, 
um, devil tried to do to stop that prophecy from Genesis 3.15. He tried to corrupt the Jews' religion and cause them to rely on tradition more than on the scriptures. And, of course, our Lord rebuked them for this on more than one occasion. Then he tried to exterminate all the Jews completely. You see, he tried this in the Old Testament under Haman. Remember that? But then the New Testament... Remember what the uh, devil put in the heart of King Herod to do, to have all the, the, the babies under, I think it was two years old and under, all of them killed. What's the devil doing here, folks? What does the devil have against Israel? Because he wants to stop that seed of the woman from bruising his head. Of course, did he succeed? No. That brings down to where we are today. The devil could not thwart the plan of God concerning the seed of the woman. Jesus did come. He did live. He did die in my place, your place. He was buried and resurrected. And now, you see, he's far out of the reach of the devil. Now the devil doesn't hope to ever mount an assault on Jesus Christ now as he is seated in heaven. So the devil now has his plan B. He's setting up the world for the entrance of his man, of his masterpiece. And that's what brings us to the political and this is the culture of society we're living in now. The devil is preparing our world to bring in his masterpiece, his son. Now, if you have some things, you may want to make note of these. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. So that was a very quick running history of what the devil attempted to do to thwart the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. But you see, the devil couldn't do it. When you have time, I encourage you. I didn't write the references down here. I can find them. But uh, if, you have, if you have time, look at the first words that were ever recorded by our Savior in Scripture, the very first words ever recorded by our Lord. Those words were found when he was 12 years old in the temple. And you remember what he said when his mother came to him? He said, uh, wished you not that I must be about my father's business. That's the, those are the first words that Scripture ever gives us that fell from the lips of our Savior. Do you know the last words he ever uttered on the cross before he died? Do you know the last words he ever uttered before his post-resurrection ministry? His last words were, It is finished. Now put those two occurrences together. Take the first words ever recorded from Jesus Christ. Take the last words he ever said before his resurrection. Put them together and what do you have? You have Jesus saying, I'm come to do my father's business. And then he says, my father's business is finished. Bring them together. Our Lord's entire life and ministry could be summed up in those two phrases. He came to do his father's business. He finished his father's business. And the devil couldn't do anything to stop it. However, Satan has one more, what's the expression? He has one more um, ace in the hole, and that's his Superman. That's the Antichrist. Are you there in Revelation chapter 13? Let's read about this man. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you'll know that the Antichrist goes by several names. He's called that wicked one. He's called the beast. He's referred to as the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's referred to as the little horn. He's referred to as the Antichrist. John calls him that. So he goes by several titles. There are 18 different types of the Antichrist in our Bible. 18 different men who picture for us in some way or another the Antichrist. I want to read them to you very quickly. And this list uh, is important. I hope you take time to note there are 18 types of the Antichrist. You have Cain, number one. Then you have Lamech, remember old Lamech there? Then you have Nimrod, Esau, Pharaoh, Balak, Sisera, Abimelech, Saul, Goliath, Absalom, Jeroboam, Ahab, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Herod, and then Judas Iscariot. All those men, in one way or another, picture the Antichrist. Notice there were 18 of them. How many times does 6 divide into 18? Three times, six, six, six. Don't you love how the Bible all comes together? You say, is God concerned about the numbers? Certainly he is. So you see the Antichrist here. Revelation 13, let's read about him. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads 
the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And this is John's vision. This is a man here, but he's pictured as a beast because in his nature he is more of a beast than he is a man. So John sees this beast coming up out of the water in Scripture. Uh, water, seas, often pictured a mass of humanity. You've, you've heard the phrase, I see a sea of faces out there before me. So you have the idea, here comes this Antichrist out of the masses. Then he says that his power comes from the devil, the dragon in verse 2. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Signs and wonders. you got to be careful about signs and wonders today because not everything that calls itself signs and wonders uh, is of the Lord, you see. The devil has a great counterfeit ability. Then he says here, verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now that's the entrance of the Antichrist. You know how we got to where we are today, folks? Because the devil is preparing our world for the entrance of that man we just read about, Revelation chapter 13. And it's no coincidence that in this same chapter, verse 18, remember that number 18? Six, six, six again. Look what you find in verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Verse 18 tells us about the six, six, six. You cannot improve upon the King James Bible and the unity of it. Just beautiful. I won't get off onto that just now. Uh, but I was reminded here to let you know, if, if you're interested in a little more thorough study, uh, I've, uh, the Lord's allowed me to write a commentary on every verse in the book of Revelation, 102 pages long, and that's available on our website. You can download it there. There's no cost for it if you'd be interested in taking that study a little further. But as we um, come to a conclusion here in just about 10 more minutes, I want to give you some things that I see happening today in our world, three ways in which the devil has set the stage for the Antichrist. And I pray that you give the Lord your undivided attention here. This really is the burden and my heart for the rest, for the, the really the heart of this study. First way in which the devil has prepared our world for the coming of his son of the Antichrist is that he has created an atmosphere of lawlessness and social unrest. Have you seen that in the news? Lawlessness? I mean, in certain aspects of the liberal media and with certain politics, the idea here now is to question all authority. And you can obey the authority if it agrees with your personal philosophy of life. If you don't agree with it, you don't have to obey it. Who's behind that, folks? It's the devil. The devil is fostering and he's stirring up this climate of lawlessness and social unrest. And you may say, why would that benefit the devil? I'm going to read to you from Daniel chapter 8. Maybe you'd like to turn there if you have a Bible. But in Daniel chapter 8, I'll show you why the Antichrist is bringing this thinking, this lawless thinking upon our society. In Daniel chapter number 8, Look at verse 25, Daniel 8, verse 25. This is one of the most comprehensive passages you'll find concerning the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8, verse number 35, verse 25. And also, if you're interested, um, I have uh, taught a series of 36 CDs of teaching through every verse in the book of Daniel. That's also on our website. Feel free to visit that and download those if you'd like. But notice what the Bible says about the Antichrist, Daniel 8, 25. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart, notice, and by peace shall destroy many. The devil said the Antichrist is going to come with a message of peace, 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 and it's actually going to be the destruction of the world. You can destroy a society with peace if it's all a facade, if it's all hypocrisy. And do you know why the devil is fomenting this idea of lawlessness? He's getting his man, if the rapture were to happen tonight, and we were gone, 
Here the Antichrist would come on the scene and he would say, I have the answer to the lawlessness around our country. I have the answer. I'll give you peace. You follow me, you take my mark, you believe what I tell you, and I'll restore law and order to this country again and eventually to this world again. Folks, that kind of message would be welcomed in our day. And if the church were to leave here tonight, the Antichrist step on the scene, he'd give the people just what they think they want, peace. But it won't be a true and lasting peace, you see. There can be no real peace until the Prince of Peace comes. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But I hope you can see the importance of a study like this. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul said, We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. You better not be ignorant of the way he works and the way he's working in our society. So number one, how's the devil working to prepare our world for the Antichrist? He's creating an atmosphere of lawlessness. If you want to know what God thinks about authority, about the police officers and about those that keep the peace, read Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 tells us that we're to obey the authority because the authority that is has been ordained of God. And uh, you ought to read the very stern command that if you resist the ordinance, if you resist the law, you bring to yourself damnation. So you say, what's your policy on these uh, riots and these different movements about the law officers versus the criminals or whatever they want to refer to themselves? Here's my position. Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So you take it into your own hands to resist the authority God's placed in your life. But truthfully, this goes far deeper than just the attitude of these people towards law officers. It goes back to their authority in their homes. It goes back to the authority in the church. It's all a matter of authority. And the devil cultivates an atmosphere of rebellion. You know what the Bible says about rebellion in the Old Testament? It's as the sin of witchcraft. Now, from here on out, it's going to be all downhill, I'm afraid. Um, I recognize that what I'm about to say next could be kicking some sacred cows. So if I kick your particular sacred cow, I want to say this to you kindly and lovingly. I'm down here in God's promised land in the Smoky Mountains and uh, you don't have my particular address at this time, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. But I, I mean this with my heart. God's people need to wake up. Here's the second way the devil's preparing our world for the rise of the Antichrist. Don't miss it. He's conditioning humanity to look favorably upon those things that Scripture condemns. What the devil is doing in our world, he is conditioning the minds and hearts of the people to take something God said is sinful and to look at it in a favorable light. I brought a series of messages on this topic at our church some months ago, and I want to invite you to be honest with the scripture. Look at entertainment in America today. If you were to look up on the internet the top 50 most um, popular or the highest grossing movies as far as the income they took in from the past five years, Count how many of those movies deals with vampires or zombies or the undead, things like this. What does the Bible say about that? There's something to say about a society that has a preoccupation with death and with drinking blood and with things that are grotesque. Look at the toys. And we have children. Go to Walmart sometime. I'm not endorsing any Walmart or uh, make that disclaimer, I guess. But look at the toys. You see toys, not so much uh, cowboys and Indians for the boys. What you see is you see these grotesque mutant uh, figures, these undead figures and blood and gore. Where did all that come from? You know what the Bible says about drinking blood? Again, I'm talking about the... I'm not off on a tangent here, by the way. Uh, I'm um, giving you something that I believe Scripture teaches. Both Testaments, folks, condemn the practice of drinking blood. Old Testament, Genesis 9-4, and the New Testament, Acts 15-20. Now you say, where in the world did you get this as far as the Antichrist? The Antichrist, if you'll look in Revelation chapter 9, when he shows up, he's going to show up with a bad group of cats, man. I mean, he's going he's to show up with demonic, wicked, evil 
personages. Look at it in Revelation chapter 9. You know what the devil has to do? Hear me. You know what he has to do? The devil has to get people to look at the demonic and the satanic. And the devil's job is to make those things, to make those things look warm and familiar and entertaining, so forth. And, of course, that's what he's doing. Look in Revelation chapter number 9. Revelation chapter number 9. Now, this is what's going to be coming during the tribulation. Look what the scripture says. Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him were given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So you got the earth open up here. And uh, something's going to come out here, folks. Notice. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, only those which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Verse 7 is the key. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. You know what you have here? You have a demonic, mutant spiritual being, something that's grotesque and horrible. But if he were to show up in the movie theaters today, people would just think he's part of the crew. You see what I mean? There is no aversion of these things. People are getting used to this sort of thing by way of entertainment, by way of the media. So when they come, you know what's going to happen? The world's going to receive them. And, of course, the devil's doing that even now. He's conditioning humanity to view that which is evil, preoccupied with death. I worry about folks uh, who are preoccupied with death and they enjoy things about the undead. You know who was preoccupied with death in the New Testament? It was that demon-possessed maniac. He was preoccupied with death. And again, I'm, I'm telling you these things because I care about you, but you better stay away from those things. Stay away from those things Scripture has condemned. Stay away from those things that... Uh, come out of the pit of hell because when the church is gone and there's no more moral restraint on the earth as there is now, the world's going to open wide its arms to receive these things. So you have this threefold attack. You have a, an attack on authority. The devil's getting the Antichrist ready and getting the world ready to receive the Antichrist. He'll come with a plan for peace. But then I want to give you this finally. The devil has and is, and will continue to do so, foster a feeling of hatred and disgust toward Bible-believing Christians. And I'll say it again. The devil is fostering a feeling of hatred and disgust toward Bible-believing Christians. Notice I didn't say just Christians, Bible-believing Christians. The book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, Paul says to Timothy that in the last days men will be despisers of those that are good. Do you want to be hated in this day and just be a good, godly person? You'll be hated, sure enough. And see, the devil's doing that, folks. Now, I'm going to use my sanctified imagination here. When the church leaves this earth, the Antichrist is going to step forward at some point. I think it'll be very soon after the rapture, but, of course, there's no clear verse on how much time has to elapse between the rapture and the revelation of the Antichrist. But he'll step forth, and he'll have to say something about where we all went. Have you ever thought about the day after the rapture? And I'm not going to be here, so I'm just speculating now. But uh, I can almost imagine the scenario may be something like this. Everybody's looking to government. The government has no answers. Where are all these people? I mean, the U.N. Security Council would probably be in emergency session 24 hours a day. What's happened? Where have all these folks gone? Uh, Washington may not know there was a rapture. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, you're going to have this explanation. And what a time for the Antichrist to step on the scene and say, 
God has purged our society of all these bigoted, narrow-minded, right-wing Bible thumpers who were an impediment to our social agenda. Now, that may seem far out, but don't forget, Paul told uh, the Thessalonians that God would send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What lie is it? Well, the lie that comes from this man of sin, this son of perdition. And so these are just three ways in which the devil is preparing our world and has prepared our world for the coming of the Antichrist. Now, here's the positive note I'll leave you with. I didn't intend for you to leave this session here discouraged about the work of the devil in raising up the Antichrist. I want you to be encouraged because, you see, the Scripture teaches that he that now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed in his time. You see, the Bible teaches that the Lord's going to remove us. And although we may be seeing the Antichrist, I'm not going to dare put a name or a face on him. I think that sort of talk is premature and foolish. But he cannot be revealed as the son of perdition until the church is gone. So for me, while I sorrow for the shape of the world, I don't know how we got here. We got here from that conflict going way back to Genesis 3.15. And if you joined us late, I encourage you to go back and watch that first part. That lays the foundation. But it should do a twofold thing for you to see the preparation of our world to receive the Antichrist. It should make you thankful that you've got a Savior who warned you and brought you out of darkness into light. And it should give you a greater burden to reach those millions who still sit in darkness and who will be here and will have to undergo that time that the Bible speaks of as great tribulation. Now, I don't make any claims of being the authority on this issue. I'm not an authority on much of anything at all. But I do enjoy the Scripture, and I hope maybe that this study, if nothing else, could give you a perspective on why things are happening the way they are in our world. This situation we're living in didn't take the Lord by surprise. You see, uh, it wasn't an afterthought. Uh, the Lord is a God of foreknowledge. He knows what will happen before it happens. And I want to encourage you that, yes, this is a bad day, and evil men, seducers, shall wax worse and worse. But if you know the Lord is your Savior, you've been promised the victory. And if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, let me plead with you. Come to the Lord. Come to the one who will translate you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That's what Bible salvation is. And so when you see these reports on the news and you see these things coming to pass, don't let it shake your confidence. Don't, don't fall apart emotionally. Don't say, I never thought it'd be this bad. If you believe your Bible, you knew it'd be this bad and it's going to get worse, I'm afraid. But we know that before that time of great worldwide persecution falls, just as God did with Lot, we'll be brought out. Paul says that God has not appointed us to wrath, and I'm thankful for it. And I appreciate you being with us in this study. Uh, we're going to close here. We've been going about an hour. Uh, there's a lot more that I could have mentioned. Maybe we'll do this again. If you have any questions you'd like for uh, me to look at, um, I'll uh, look at those. There's a couple that responded, and I'll get to you privately because the answer to that question would take a little longer than what I have here. But I'll try to respond to you. Um, I do appreciate you joining us here. We're having our family Bible study here, and I'm glad you'll be a part with us. If you have any questions you'd like me to give a stab at it, do that, and uh, I'll try to get them answered and get back to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us and for your people. I appreciate you for being so kind to us. As we see our world being prepared for the Antichrist, we know that we as believers are not to be looking for him. We're to be looking for Christ. We look for the Savior. But, uh, Lord, we want to be wise concerning the wiles of the devil and help us to warn others who are not ready. In Jesus' name, amen.